Good morning. Welcome to Create at COGEX. I'm Christine Lorzakert. I run a consultancy called Little Differ, and I'm delighted to be your MC for today. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Good evening for those of you dialing in from far flung places from London. I'm sure it is hot everywhere on the planet at the moment. We have a really exciting day ahead of us today. The stage has been co created or co curated by the Creative Industries Council. This is a joint industry and government forum that was set up to give a voice to the creative industries and to basically capitalize on opportunities and also help solve some of the challenges that face the sector. We had a really exciting day yesterday, lots of fantastic sessions, but the main takeout was how much the sector is growing. 22% increase in inward investment, um, making it one of the fastest investment propositions in, in the world for tech, and a 50% increase in job roles as well, which is also fabulous news. Please join the conversation. It's hashtag createuk and hashtag cogex2021. Do um, ask questions in the chat if you would like to. And without further ado, the future is here, the future is now, the future is China, especially when it comes to social media. To tell us why and how, um, I'm delighted to introduce the moderator for the day, Becky Zhu. She is Senior Trade Investment Officer based at the British High Commission, uh, British Consulate General in Shanghai uh, at the Department for International Trade. Welcome, Becky. Hi, thank you, Christine. So, hello everyone, um, welcome to our panel. I'm Becky, I will be the moderator today. So first, I want to take this opportunity to thank the organizer for putting together this wonderful event. Thank you. Today, we're going to talk about the future of social media and why it is driven by China. So here we have Anup Mar, the founder and CEO of Cumin. Momo Estrella, Head of Digital Design at IKEA China, and Haifeng Li, the Director of Industry Markets at NetEase Media Group. Hi, welcome. Hi, Becky. Hi, everyone. Hi, and Mr. Hi. Li's talking hey, Becky, will be hello. in Chinese, and I will interpret for him. Uh, okay. Hi, um, so welcome, guys. Um, would you like to tell us a little more about your companies and them yourselves so that the audience can know you better? So may I start with you, Arnold? I was hoping you wouldn't start with me. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I'll take it. Hi, everyone. Uh, really nice to be at COGX. I want to thank the organizers, Christine. Thank you, Rob. And also thank you, Janet. Uh, for, for, for hosting, for, for organizing this event. Um, so I'm Arnold um, and I'm from uh, an agency called Cumin. We focus mostly on helping Western brands to understand and engage uh, Chinese customers. More recently, we've been working with people like, uh, like Maria, Sony, um, but we also, since the pandemic, found that a lot of Chinese businesses are trying to globalize. So we're also working <coughs> with people like WeChat and uh, WeChat and Huawei. Um, we also run a few other things. One is called DaoInsights.com. Um, check it out if you're interested in Chinese news and case studies. So we're trying to create an online publication where we're helping people to understand more uh, what's happening in China on the ground. So we are essentially translating Chinese news uh, in tech, creative and marketing industries, posting daily news two or three times and also case studies directly from Chinese brands. Uh, in China, um, this kind of stuff you wouldn't see anywhere, and we felt like it was a good opportunity for the industry to upskill uh, upskill ourselves on what's happening on the ground. Um, we also have a, a business unit called One Team Media, where we are creating in-house, uh, I guess we can call them media assets on channels like TikTok, um, <coughs> YouTube, but also Chinese channels like Douyin and Little Red Book. Um, in line with our mission overall of opening the world to China, we are helping Chinese people to understand global cultures and likewise for everyone around the, around the world to understand Chinese people and cultures. Okay, so Momo, your turn. Sure. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Momo. I am the uh, design manager at the China Digital Hub, uh, which is a hub um, that is part of IKEA. Um, me and my teams, we look after all the digital experience in, in China. 
basically what that means we're trying to modernize how our brand is perceived experienced and how it transacts with the chinese customers um very practically what that looks like is like i manage a large design team uh, across a few capabilities like design research um uh, ux and ui and design operations so that we can build um, different interactive transactional touch points across our customer journey uh, essentially moving us from a mono-channel retailer into a non-channel organization. Yeah, that's me. Okay, thank you. And uh, Haifeng, uh, please, uh, Li 老师, <laughs> 可以向大家再介绍一下您吗? Uh, 大家好, 我是李海峰, uh, 我这来自网易, uh, 我有大概十几年的互联网从业经验, 然后那个, uh, 很高兴在这里和大家, uh, 相聚在一起, 谢谢。嗯。uh, Mr. Lee Haifeng has 10 years experience in traditional advertising and interactive marketing. Um, uh, he is very pleased to be here and see everyone here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lee Haifeng is from NetEase, sorry. Okay. Um, thank you so much for participating. Since we are uh, discussing social media in China, would you like to give us the landscape on that? Um, so, Arnold, you look like that you want to go first. Um, very, very quickly. So, social media in China, I think, is very different to um, not just the way it's evolved, but the, I guess the way it added up at, at this point in time is, I think, is very different to the West. Um, first of all, the biggest difference is, for me personally, is that when social media exploded in China, or rather the first iteration of social media happened in China, uh, most of China's internet penetration was very low. <clears throat> so most people didn't actually have access to internet or uh, less than 50%. Uh, this was about 10 years ago, right? And when that happened, um, when, when the first iPhone 3G was released, which was kind of when mobile internet started to uh, start, started to become big in, in the West. In China, people were existing, essentially accessing the internet for the first time through mobile only, rather than adopting from desktop to mobile. Uh, this meant that a lot of the Chinese businesses, a lot of Chinese tech companies, were able to create um, mobile social platforms, or, or just platforms in general, uh, tailored exactly for the mobile experience from the ground up, rather than trying to adapt like a desktop experience, such as Facebook, or Twitter, or LinkedIn, or Instagram. All of these were essentially, ex except for the except for Instagram, the other ones were all built for desktop first, then adapted to a mobile environment. Whereas in China, this is different. Pretty much every platform, whether it's WeChat, um, Weibo to a certain extent, but certainly Douyin, they were all built for mobile environment from the ground up, right? Uh, and this is a big difference. This means that um, a lot of the functionalities and user behaviors were able to be created from scratch. So people didn't have like a legacy attachment to desktop and web 2.0 experiences. Um, so you look at stuff like social commerce where it doesn't, has, still hasn't really picked up in the West because I think because people attach to kind of like a legacy web 2.0 experience, they want to buy stuff on their browsers, on their laptops or desktops, whereas in China people didn't have that, right? So, um, so social commerce and live commerce were two things that were able to pick up in China much quicker than it is in the West. I think less about the technology, more about people's kind of like legacy behaviors and expectations of, of what these experiences look like on the internet. Um, the other thing I find really fascinating is WeChat. Um, people kind of call WeChat like a super app uh, or like a, you know, like a, like, uh, uh, but, but, but I think it's more, it's, it's, it's more than just an app, right? If you look at what an operating system at the heart of it, it's essentially a kernel where you upload and customize apps on top of it to make it your own, right? So WeChat, I think for me, is more like an operating system um, where you get the WeChat, the basic functionalities, which is basically like a, a web of services that connects people together. But to customize it, you can add mini programs, you can shop on it, you can buy your tickets on there, you can pay in restaurants, you can do everything essentially almost like an operating system does and you customize it like an operating system but instead of a kernel you get a web of services app is basically the foundation of it so and, and there's nothing like that in the west right so i always say wechat is more of a social os and less of an application and all of these things 
I'm sure Momo will expand on in, in a second, creates like much different uh, experiences and opportunities for brands to build affinity with customers, to build to to build different user journeys and different funnels uh, for conversion and sales, um, which I'm sure we'll touch on later. Thank you. Okay, Momo. Yeah, thank you, Arnold. That was a um, that was a great um, uh, a great I guess uh, canvas to to try and paint on. So my add to that would be that. I think at the beginning, social media was understood as something that happens just between maybe um, people like citizens or friends or acquaintances. When you look at WeChat, the basic engine of it is very simple, right? It allows you to send messages to friends or strangers, and then they add a different layers. Like they allow you to send uh, money to friends and strangers, and then they allow you to send media, I guess, to friends and strangers. So. On these connective lines, uh, there was a massive opportunity that showed up in how businesses could then build new tools and services and systems basically to, to connect to customers in a different way. Um, and with the recent addition of, of other technologies that I think we're gonna co cover later, like uh, live streaming and remote selling and e-commerce and whatnot, uh, which has become that super app. So from that context, I think social media has moved away from just being the act of being social online or the act of sharing media with friends uh, online to, as Arnold said, to become like a, a fabric of how the entire um, country operates. And I think what's what's maybe unique that I want to maybe highlight is consumer behaviors. Consumer behaviors that we see here in China are, are pretty different from what we traditionally think, right? That they are spoiled for choice. They get the newest, they get the best. As Arnold said, there's no legacy, there's no nostalgia, no habits. And in contrast, um, for our case, um, from our observation, a lot of retailers uh, have provided experiences that may look old and stale compared to what Chinese consumers are used to. And the evolution of this has even accelerated during COVID. So uh, across everything new, for example, that we're trying now to do is, is around understanding uh, these new consumer behaviors, right? Um, we no longer rely on, on assumptions or on data alone, right? We now rely a lot on research and qualitative data and quantitative studies to try and really understand um, what's the best way for us to respond to this uh, to this landscape, right? So it's not so much about the technology or the tools sometimes, but really understanding what are the behaviors that are existing or happening there, and how do you capitalize on those? How do you how do how do you get in there as a, as a brand or as a company? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Hai Feng, um, Li 老师，你能讲呃，根据呃，根据第一个问题，给我们一些你的洞见吗？ <咳>呃，关于 social media 的影响力吧，我想在这里跟大家分享一个呃一个概念，就是 KOC。呃，相信大家对这个 KOL 都不陌生啊，但是 KOC 呢，呃，其实是可以呃引起大家关注的。KOC 是什么呢？是关键意见消费者，在中国数字营销界现在呃非常引起关注。KOC 是日常生活中的一般消费者，他们在社交媒体上主动分享对产品或服务的用户心得。与 k r 相比呢，虽然 KOC 的粉丝啊只在几百到十万的这样的一个区间，但这个群体数量巨大，因此在粉丝上呃拥有更高的互动率。KOC 在网友眼中呢也更加亲切与真实，因此当所有社交媒体需要购买建议的时候呢，会倾向于 KOC 的推荐。啊，所以我觉得大家对 KOC 呢，应该是一个可以更加关注的一个群体。OK。OK， thank you， and I will translate for uh Mr. Li. Um, Chinese netizens have its creativity. I believe that the term KOL is familiar to. Um, the latest term KOC, uh, which means key opinion customer. Uh, is attracting attention in uh, Chinese digital marketing industry. KOCs are average customers um, themselves, and they will actively share their after-use experiences of products or services on social media. Compared with KOL, the KOC only has fans in the range of hundreds to 100,000. However, KOC has a higher interaction rate with fans and KOC is cordial and real in the eyes of netizens. As a result, when many social media users need to look 
for purchase advice. They prefer KOC's recommendations. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for all your insightful remarks. That was very informative. In China, the creator economy is super hot now. So do you want to talk a little about the social and live commerce from your personal experience or from your day-to-day -day work? Okay, so this time, may we start with uh, Haifeng, Mr. Li, please. Uh, Li 老师, 您能就第二个问题给我们一些看法吗? Uh, 就是关于第二个问题创造创造者经济的这个的力量 那互联网打破了时空的区隔，提供了无边界的网络场域，消费者给消费者带来去雇主化的产品需求，催生了依托平台的创作的群体，比如网络呃网络主播呀、自媒体创作者，呃嗯呃，可以先帮我翻译一下
Um, one example that I can put is when Mobike started. Um, the first Mobikes that you know the the, the bike uh, rental bikes that you could you could just scan a code and get on the bike and finish your last mile commute. The first versions of Mobike were like very heavy, very bulky. And you could see strategic decisions being reflected in the product. You could see that they would build for durability. Um, later on, once the market kind of adopted Mobike as a, as a new thing, you could see the, the new version of the bike had a more comfortable seat. You could adjust the height of it. The separation between the handle was a bit better, was more ergonomic. The materials changed. It wasn't as heavy as before. So a lot of those decisions told me that now they were thinking about scaling up, for example. And they organize themselves, their supply chain, all the processes around that. So I think none of that would have been possible without having these, these two things, right? A mindset of exploration, curiosity, and you know, exploring new things, but also the mindset of being okay with things that are either not necessarily finished or hyper-polished and that have probably some element of risk within that. So contradictory, I, I guess, at times between these two things, that's what I feel is something that is the future um, in a way. The future belongs to those that are curious and optimistic, and, and I see a lot of that happening. Thank you, thank you, Momo. And uh, Arnold, what's your point? Yeah, thank you, thank you, back. Oh, uh, oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Becky and uh, Momo. Thank you. That was uh, I agree with you on all, all of those above. Um, I just want to add a few things from my side on what I think might be coming to the West and what we're seeing in China already. So the first thing is um, the first thing is videos. I know this might be kind of like a short form video, lo-fi short form specifically. I know this is something obvious, so I'll keep it really short. Uh, but I think we're still at the tip of the iceberg for this. If you look what's happening in China with Douyin, I think right now it's four or 500 million users uh, daily active, right? Um, and you look at the rest of the world, which is TikTok. TikTok is Western version of Douyin in China. Uh, and for whole of the rest world is something like 400 million. So you can compare the population of China and also the population of the rest of the world. We're talking like a comparison of 50 some penetration rate versus something like 10 percent penetration rate. So there's still massive growth on lo-fi short form videos. If you're a brand and you've not looked at how to leverage this format for your brand to build affinity with customers, to create content, whether it's in-house or via a partner externally, I really suggest you look at now because it's about to explode over the next couple of years. Um, the second thing I think is live, uh, li li live, not just live commerce, but live streaming in general. If you look at the evolution of kind of social media, uh, the reason that we've changed from um, kind of like uh, uh, network based to content based, uh, which is like the, the, the first to the second generation, uh, then from mostly text and images to short form videos. You, we even saw like Snap and Vine before the emergence of like TikTok and Douyin. Uh, all of these things are happening because people want to get closer to creators. The more, the more we see going from the last couple of decades from kind of like initial like MySpace through to Facebook to Instagram to LinkedIn to Twitter and then finally to Vine and to TikTok, these formats are there to enable people to get closer to creators. For brands, it's to enable brands to get close to their customers. And the next natural evolution in that is, first of all, video, which is kind of like the, the, the current situation. And then live, the, you can't get closer to someone in terms of experience and content than live. So we're seeing in China, a lot of brands are using internal live streamers, right? Not just anyone, but even their CEOs. So you look at kind of like, uh, uh, during like Singles Day and 618, which is actually coming up in three days. You guys should really check that out and look out for that. Um, what kind of cases are coming out? But CEOs of massive companies, like billion dollar businesses are streaming directly and promoting and selling their products. So if you're a brand, I think, I, I think looking at building in-house live streaming capabilities is going to be a future-proof investment, right? Uh, whether this is your senior leadership, those who are really great on camera, that have charisma, or you can even build like a specific team within your marketing department, you kind of really want to own this in-house, right? Because you don't want to 100% rely, you want to rely 50% on externals like traditional influencer marketing, because live is just such a risky environment. You really want to control that in-house. So I think starting to build that um, is, is, is going to be a really great investment. But yeah, that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. Thank you all. Uh, what you shared is really inspiring. I think we have all learned a lot from the discussion. 
From the interest of time, uh, we have to move on to the Q&A section now. So uh, I can see in the private chat, we have some questions from the audience. The first one is, um, why hasn't a WeChat type social operating system emerged in the West yet? Uh, I will translate for Mr. Lee. Uh, why微信这样的社交操作系统社交媒体操作系统 Okay, so um, let me know if uh, one of you wants to take the question. Hey, I, I can take the question. Maybe I can add a few things while people are thinking. Is that okay, Becky? Right. Sure. Awesome. Uh, th this is a great question. Um, so thank you for asking. We can't see your names, but I appreciate you asking this question. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is that, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, kind of right at the start, that uh, we when when <clears throat> when, all, when all of our social media were created, they were created for desktop environment for specific purposes. Um, so we didn't have the opportunity. The tech companies or like creators, entrepreneurs didn't have the opportunity to create something that was specific for mobile. Uh, and for me, WeChat is only really a platform that can work on mobile, i.e. the social OS model. Uh, the second thing is that a lot of people in the West uh, tend to want something for specific things. Uh, I think a lot of it's around kind of like data sharing, right? Like people don't want fundamentally and culturally one company to have all of their data for everything. Imagine uh, like WeChat basically have people's data for everything from uh, for, from booking taxis through to paying for stuff. Um, like like e everything, uh, all of their all of their service requirements, as well as their social activities, so sharing their photos to their friends, um, and I think the final thing is that uh, <clears throat> it's just like the the technology. Just so the first two things I mentioned it was kind of like co consumer behavior. The final thing is the technology, right? Like we just don't have. Uh, the environment, because we're so reliant right now on card payments, on contactless payments, we're so reliant on on, on, on certain things that are already part of our society and part of our lives. Um, we can't innovate and create new uh, service design. So uh, we chat with the QR code uh, and also actually the, the QR code and, and is a center of connecting all of this because when you have payment, you can implement so many more service design features, whether it's cinema tickets, paying the shops or whatever. So we, we the technology wasn't there, uh, but also kind of like the customer behavior wasn't really there for, for that to emerge and, and not creating the perfect storm as kind of like Momo mentioned earlier. Thank you. Um, is there anyone want to add something or should I go to the uh, second question? I can just very quickly add that. I think new behaviors are very expensive, I guess, as, a, as an investment. And, and the reason I mentioned that is because um, it was a low barrier to create a new behavior in China, like scanning QR codes, which was what catapulted WeChat into mainstream usage. One of the reasons why uh, that happened is because China actually leapfrogged credit cards. So we moved almost, we almost forgot about credit cards. We almost moved directly into digital payments. And because there wasn't that much infrastructure built into everybody's minds and into the entire, I don't know, like the entire city, the entire country, there wasn't, a, there wasn't enough, I guess, room to try something new. Um, but moving away from existing behaviors in you know, the very basics of payments, for example, um, to be honest, I have this hypothesis that if it wasn't by payments, which would have scaled the way it did. Uh, which was a messaging platform and it was a great one, but it was only when they added the possibility to pay that they scaled out of proportion, like disproportionately blew everybody's minds. Um, but I think it's because they solved that pain point. They created that contactless efficiency that did not rely on physical things. You know, it, it was in, in, in resonance with what, what, what the market was in a way uh, expecting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. So, shall I move on to the second one? What's the China's platform with the most potential in 2021 and beyond? Um, I will translate for Mr. Li. 呃，中国的哪个平台是最有潜力的？ Okay, um, let me know if anyone wants this one. 
个中国的 ，OK， 中国的短视频平台这个非常的呃活跃，呃，像抖音、快手这样的平台是非常有潜力的。那从网易的角度来讲，我们也在做一些 social media 的这样的一些努力，比如说网易云音乐就是一个比较新颖的。呃，做这个 social media 的这样的一个音乐平台。OK。OK。So Mr. Lee just said all kinds of short video platform would be very very active in China recent in recent years. So for example, Douyin and Kuaishou. So from the、um, perspective of NetEase, they have been trying very hard on the、uh, social media.、Um, Uh, effort. So,、uh, for example, the net is cloud me- music is the one they think are very promising. Thank you. Anyone want to add?、Uh, I I can go. Okay.、Uh, just very quickly,、um, I can tell you guys、uh, in the audience what we're investing in the most right now. So. Uh, a we, with our in-house media assets,、um, but also with our with with our clients' budget as well.、Um, we're probably out of all out of all the investment we're making time and money wise, we're probably spending about fifty to sixty percent of our effort on Douyin right now,、um, because so 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 as Lila also mentioned, I think、uh, short form video is going to be massive in twenty twenty one and beyond. But Douyin specifically is the pro- probably the biggest and most famous one out out of all of them.、Um, the reason we're investing so much money in this is because brands and creators are able to get traction from zero followers. Right? The way that the platform works is every time you post a piece of content, it doesn't matter how many followers you have. That content goes into the global pool of all the audience, and it starts with like maybe no point no 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 one percent of people, and then as a engagement.、Uh, Uh, reacts positively, it goes to no point, no, 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 one percent, and then so on and so forth. So it's kind of like a ripple effect, rather than a network effect, where it goes to your followers first, and then it goes to your followers, followers, and the followers, followers. It it, it creates like a ripple effect,、uh, r- r- rather than like a network effect. So that's really great for like a zero star for brands, for creators. This is where we're investing most of our money on. The second platform where we're investing maybe like twenty, thirty percent of our money on is Little Red Book. Uh, I think Little Red Book is going to be amazing. First of all, it's ninety percent plus female users. There isn't a platform on the planet that's like that,、uh, let alone in China. Second of all, it's really second of all, it's really amazing for、uh, customer affinity、uh, because people have an inherent trust on the platform. It was started off as like a review platform,、um, so creating your own in-house media assets. Using creator content is going to be really great for Little Red Book, building trust, building affinity. Social commerce is also Little Red Book is one of the best platforms for social commerce conversions compared to like Douyin and other platforms. Douyin is much better for awareness, whereas Little Red Book is better for affinity and conversions.、Um, and the final thing we're investing in, maybe just ten percent to test it out, is WeChat channels.、Uh, it's WeChat's kind of first foray into awareness-driven content that is a network focused.、Um, So I know I'm aware we're running out of time, so I'm gonna cut it short. But、uh, yeah, th- I think that's another thing to look out for,、um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arnold. So、uh, here comes the. We have only five minutes left, so here comes our last question, which is my favorite one. You know, as our team is focusing on the business exchange between UK and China, so this question is also what I want to ask. And what should brands looking to China think about first? Ah,、uh, 当这个品牌啊、uh, 在看中国市场的时候，他们首先应该思考什么 ？Okay, so who want to answer my favorite question? Everyone, so polite. Do you want to go, Momo, or should I、uh, start rambling? Yeah,、again? sure, <laughs> sure, sure.、Um, I guess so. Brands looking looking to China think about first.、Um, I would say suspend all existing beliefs about this place. Like, bring your mind to completely empty and be prepared to invest on on research. Whether you do that by looking at large、uh, volumes of data, do like quantitative studies or qualitative research, understanding consumers really, really well is the beginning of anything. 
Um, I, I, you will not believe the amount of businesses that I've seen that started entering China, just assuming things and building things and expecting everything to work. And they failed massively within weeks or months. Um, and you know, something as simple as understanding key core behaviors is, is probably what's gonna help anybody really to understand this place and thrive in it. Okay, so we have only um, four minutes left. So anyone want to add last chance? Yeah, uh, I, I just want to add a little bit on top of what Momo said. I think, first of all, I 100% agree, res resale expectations, but I would also go as far as kind of resetting your brand a little bit, right? So rather than going in being like, oh, you know, we, we're really successful in the West, we have 100-year heritage, actually no one gives a shit about that <laughs> in, in China. They care about what your product is and what your service is and how, what benefit you can bring to their daily lives, right? So I would focus on a couple of things. One, really understanding people and cultures. So looking at like great, great marketing, great communication, uh, always makes people feel something and solves a problem. So I would look at there's so many cultural tensions in China. It's a literally right now a cultural melting pot of opportunities, right? You go in there, every street corner you turn, there's a cultural tension. So whether it's between the previous generation, the current generation, or expectation of kind of collective society versus individual society, um, there's so many different things, globalization that's happening in China right now. I would look at a cultural tension that connects with what your brand stands for globally and try to come up with a big idea that is locally, that's hyper relevant, hyper specific to China, start off, first of all. Uh, secondly, really looking at the platforms. So rather than trying to duplicate your content from Western platforms to China, uh, like we see that a lot, right? People will kind of tend their globe assets, put some Chinese writing on it, and then post it in China. That's not what you do. You create content in China from scratch, right? There's an easy way of doing that. Rather than doing everything in-house, like none of us can pretend like we know what Chinese Gen Z like sitting in the middle of Camden. Um, I think it's really important to work with creators. To work with creators, whether you're trying to target skaters or basketball players, or artists or fat, fat, fat fashion or fashion or foodies use the creators and commission content in china create content that's for them by them uh works really well in china and really well on short video platforms i can talk all day about this but i know we're running out of time so uh pass the mic back on to becky <laughs> yeah okay thank you arnold thank you so much okay that's all we have time for today to bet we have to end here Okay, and um, thank you all again for your time. Thank you to all of our panelists and the audience. We should have a very good time at Critech and CogX. Goodbye. And uh, I will hand back to Christine. Thank you so much, Becky. That was really interesting. Thank you. Gosh, so much to learn. Um, what are the big takeouts? Well, I guess one, um, China being a cultural melting pot of opportunities. Fantastic line. Um, create China specific content. Don't just badge your Western content and um, subtitle it. And I think, you know, ultimately the future is plenty of growth still in short form video and the future is live. The best line that came out of it, though, was the future belongs to the curious and the optimistic. And doesn't that basically encompass everything that we all believe in? How wonderful. It also leads us very nicely into the next session. Uh, do join us in 20 minutes at 11 o'clock, where we hear from two of the hottest creative shops in tech. We hear from Facebook and from TikTok and from one of the hottest challenger agencies, WCC, v, sorry, VCCP. Um, 11 o'clock, hashtag Createch UK. See you then. <laughs>